to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and we're continuing our conversation about the Second Commandment. Last week, we got into it and could not stop, so we're going to keep going. Um, Brian especially wanted to talk about the regulative principle. Yes. So I'm going to read the second commandment again, just because it's nice to have that in our minds. Yeah. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So what I want to address here is uh, what in the reform tradition is called the regulative principle of worship that is centered around not just the directly addressed text of the second commandment, but also in its necessary consequences. And so in the reform tradition, they have traditionally a word that we Typically, we'll come back to that. <laughs> yes, we'll, we will come back to that. We, were, we recoil at it, but it's a, it's, a, it's a good word. It's not a bad word. Yeah. They have traditionally said that this lays out the principle that God determines how he is worshipped. The other nations, the pagan nations surrounding Israel, they worship their false gods through totems, things of wood and stone that are through some magical process or element in the in the sacred formation of these images are taken to be the instantiations of their deity in the physical realm. And God says, you've got this wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Not only are those gods false, but the true God who you worship, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, he doesn't operate according to these magical paradigms that you see in the surrounding nations. And so your worship as a result is going to look differently at a base level. Others worship what they presume their gods to look like or what the ancients have told them their gods look like. But you saw no image in the fire and the smoke when the law came to you at Sinai. And so the Lord is not worshipped according to what he looks like, because in his divine essence, he doesn't look like anything. He's so outside of creation and above it that he doesn't even look like anything that would be a part of it. That's how grand and infinitely above us he is. Scripture so, calls him the invisible God. Exactly. Now, when we get to Christ's incarnation, we are told that Christ is the image of the invisible God. Mm -hmm. But that's also something that is true of him in his divine essence in eternity. So we can't necessarily look to his human nature as, look, that is what God looks like. He does look like Christ because Christ is God. There's some uh, Constantinopolitan Nicene <laughs> theology in that. There this are is where so it gets many so weeds confusing. to get deep into. Many weeds, yeah. but I'm trying to just kind of skim along the tops yeah. of the weeds. In Sounds any case, very Snoopy ish. <laughs> in any case, what this commandment tells us, and the Reformed tradition has also traditionally held that all moral commands are sum summarized in the Ten Commandments, which are then further summarized by Christ in uh, the New Testament as well. But specifically, if we look here, the words are, don't make any graven images and don't worship them because I am God and I'm a jealous God. And you can look at that and say, oh, cool. We're not supposed to make any graven images of, of other gods. So that means we can make images of God, right? No. <laughs> he still determines how he is worshipped. And there, uh, there's many, many implications that you can take from that in any number of of doctrines, but the re regulative principle of worship in particular is only in regards to worship as God's people, as the church. And so when it comes to images, yes, they're denied 
in full in every aspect of life. But they're also denied as something that is involved in worship as well. And what is interesting... So, so what you're saying is that you can't have your imageless church worship on Sunday and then go bow down to idols the rest of the days of the week? That's correct. You weren't saying because, that, that images are wrong, period, but yeah. idols are wrong, period, wherever they are. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. okay. And the thing is, is that when you make an image of God and you try to make the claim, well, this isn't something I'm worshiping. Mm. There's there a, should be something a wrong lot with of that. a catch twenty two in that because <laughs> it's like, hey, this is the image of the God that I love and revere and worship, but I'm not worshiping that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's interesting. And what's interesting also is that in the mo well, I, I shouldn't say the modern age; it's been something throughout all of church history. But there's a trend, and I see it most often in um, broad evangelicalism, which is called biblicism. And that is to take the uh, the words of Scripture at their their face value, which can be good. That's not necessarily a problem, but it does become a problem if you don't have any other outside input. If it's just you and your Bible, you're ignoring roughly two thousand years of godly men who were placed in authority over the church by the Spirit. And in uh, infilled with the Spirit themselves to assist God's bride in doctrine. That, in our tradition, it's the Westminster Confession. It's the three forms of unity. The, if you want to include the them, the London Baptist creeds. Confession. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and what I, I find, I, can I can I break in here because we're talking to all kinds of people. Let me. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to kind of. Of course. Save, save us from, from pointless accusations. <laughs> um, when you were talking about 2,000 years of men and women who, have, who are giving us advice, let, let us be very clear where that advice is coming from. They read the Bible. Mm -hmm. They read the same Bible we read. What we're talking about here is the priesthood of believers. Mm -hmm. um, C.S. I don't know if it was C.S. Lewis or if it was Chesterton said that tradition simply means giving our ancestors a vote. If, if uh, the God's, democracy of the dead. Yeah. If God spoke, if God speaks clearly in scripture, then he spoke as clearly to the saints a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago, as he speaks now. And by building on their understanding, the, we, we can more quickly get to where they were. And then one hopes surpass them and understand yet more. Amen. We have to know we need to be careful and not pat ourselves on the back too much. So in, you said biblicism, I've heard one writer call it solo scriptura. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, me and my Bible flying out there alone, and I don't have to listen to anybody because priesthood of the believer and sola scriptura. No, it's sola scriptura means that God speaks to all of his people, and I don't have the right to shut you out, especially once I find out we disagree. Now, if everyone picked up the Bible and we all automatically said together exactly the same thing, that'd be great, but that's we know that's not how it works. <laughs> right. Yeah, We pick the Bible up and we don't all automatically agree, and it's not the Bible's fault. It's our fault for our sins. And so we need to have the humility to be open both to our brothers and sisters who are alive now and to those who have gone before and to the things they've written that yet thousands more have agreed to and proved and tried and said, this is indeed the word of God. So um, I, I just wanted to clarify that we're mm -hmm. not into some strange kind of ancestor worship. We're simply saying God's been faithful to, well, 20, 30, 40 generations at this point. Mm -hmm. I appreciate promise, that clarification. And promises to be uh, faithful to a thousand more. So one hopes that we too will contribute to the understanding of the church has of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And um, so with that, with that I have, I'm sorry if I disrupted your flow of thought, but I thought that was really important to communicate because not everyone has traveled the same roads we have. And some people... Oh, I agree. Some people might get really nervous at this point. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree. I, I appreciate add that. add on Please two do. different, two further getting us off the railroad tracks, but two points of personal experience that I was reminded of just now. Um, one is a church that I used to attend to, wonderful, godly people, but there were no confessions. And so in a lot of things, it felt like reinventing the wheel. Every time we had a disagreement, it was kind of like, we're dealing with this on a surface issue as totally fresh eyes. And it's like, hmm, maybe, you know, some people in church history have thought about these things before and we could check with them. Um, second piece of personal experience, a few years ago when I was under the preaching of a pastor that 
didn't always communicate to me in a way that really spoke to me, if that makes sense. Um, but I took a lot of comfort from remembering that, you know, at any point in in history, in redemptive history, God could have rained down leaflets from heaven and given <laughs> scripture <laughs> to all his people at once. But that's not what he chose to do. He chose for his word to go out spoken and explained by teachers in community. Um, um, I think that's as notable as his revealing himself in in words mm -hmm. is his revealing himself to a community in words. Yes, the the scriptures have specific meaning to a community, and that is the bride of Christ, mm -hmm. the church. Can people outside of the bride of Christ understand aspects of what scripture says? I think yes. But if they're not part of the church, it's not to them. It's not something that is necessarily directed to them, at least as far as the gospel is concerned. It's reading someone else's emails. Yes. <laughs> and sometimes uh, they the might understand what the email says better than the person who actually got the email. <laughs> sometimes. Depends, depends. sometimes. But sometimes the, the antecedents are lost. Who's you and who's he in this email? I don't... Yeah. <laughs> to whom are these promises made? Do they speak to... It's, it's calling somebody a sinner here. I don't know who that would be, really, but you know, I see the word <laughs> sinner there. Exactly. So when, uh, when we look at the second commandment as well, we also have to be careful to avoid the other ditch. There's, there's the ditch of radical individualism, and then there's also the ditch of, well, my tradition has determined these things are implications of the command. The command is clear, and yeah. then there's implications. And sometimes people look at the implications and say, well, this is this is clear. I understand that now. And therefore, anyone who believes differently on this mm -hmm. implication is is wrong. And that's not it. <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> this, this ain't it, chief. You mean in the name of telling people not to add to the word of God, we're actually adding to the word of God? Yes. Oh, that's <laughs> tricky. Very tricky. I'm well, reminded of a very old episode of Bible Man, because that's how I grew up, <laughs> wherein Pride is attacking Bible Man. Uh -huh. And at some oh. point he's like, well, what's the matter? You, you, he's, he says he's not prideful, like you're losing. He's like, no, don't you see? I'm getting him to be proud of not being proud. <laughs> not going to lie. This is the one episode of Bible Man that I saw when I wandered into a Christian bookstore one time. Yeah. It, it is, um, however, not the one that I saw. And I, don't, I have only seen one because I had to, if I was going to talk about it in an article, I had to at least have the honesty to have seen it once. Yes. <sighs> Anyway. But uh, I will I will end my tirade at this point, <laughs> which is um, many who are faithful Christians bought with the blood of Christ. They hear someone say, you know, this is a implication of the text. And if you understand that to be an implication and you're, you know, from an outside perspective, speaking of, let's say, a conviction I don't hold to, if you were to go against that, you would be going against your own conscience mm -hmm. and it would be as sin to you to, to quote Paul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that when it comes to the modern defenders of images of God in worship or in life, just in general, many of them have a aversion to that kind of, um, implication they're basically they would say what you think this is an implication well now you're trying to bind my conscience on this and yeah. i don't like that and therefore you're a legalist and a rationalist and a rationalist <laughs> um but what's also very interesting is that those same people who say well you know we're not going to do that we're going to follow what the words of scripture say then don't follow the words of scripture when it comes to images of god <laughs> it's what I might call an unfortunate inconsistency. <laughs> inconsistency um, was the word gentle. I was going for, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we're all guilty of inconsistencies in our, Absolutely. in our sins, and we need to be gentle here. But 
-hmm. For those listening, you may note that we are being somewhat vague. Very and... vague. <laughs> I could barely track with that. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> <you're being so> <laughs> because because of what Brian is saying, the moment we pick one thing, let it let us let us look at this um, large familiar denomination that insists that the Bible requires that we all paint ourselves blue on the Lord's Day. <laughs> no, I make I am making it up because I've yes. got to pick something. <laughs> Because if I start picking individual things, I'll get, you know, yeah, right. That's that's what that's right. That's what wait a minute, that's heresy. Now you're talking about now, me. Yeah, now you're talking now you've touched my my tender spot. I'm absolutely sure that I'm right about that. I we don't want to go there and there's no point in it. Right. We, we happen to like you all. Yeah. <laughs> we do. If you're listening. So that's a start. <laughs> but we I think what Brian and Brian can confirm or deny here, I think what Brian's trying to affirm, and it's what I hear in his words that we need to be very careful when we say the Bible tells us we should do this in worship when those exact words actually don't appear anywhere. Absolutely. And on the other hand, we should be very careful when we say, well, the Bible doesn't command this, therefore we can't go anywhere near it, when in fact, although there may not be an explicit command in Paul's epistles that we actually, that we actually like, it's possible that there's an example, a precedent, a principle, or a command other than Paul's epistles mm -hmm. that actually does perhaps not only allow for it, but even command it. And so it is easy to be caught in, having said all the good things we have about tradition, there can be a danger in tradition too, as every good, forgive me, Baptist knows, there is a danger in imposing the traditions of men upon the church. So we need to listen to our ancestors and to our brothers and sisters in Christ and to the confessions of the church. But you know, you come to the Westminster Confession of Faith and you mentioned the London Confession or the, or the Philadelphia Confession of Faith. These documents are nearly identical. So is the, the Savoy Declaration. But when it comes to baptism, they disagree. So at least one of them is wrong. <laughs> We have confessional standards here, and one of them is wrong. Maybe they're all wrong. Maybe we should, you know, use a fire hose or something. But um, <laughs> we, we, we have to recognize. The only valid mode of baptism is to actually pour it out from the heavens. Yeah. There you go. Go stand in the rain or jump in the ocean. I don't. So we are recognizing the limitations of creeds and confessions. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between recognizing the limitations of something and throwing it out altogether. Mm. Your, your father and your grandfather have doubtless given you wonderful advice and one or two things that made absolutely no sense. <laughs> the fact that the, they did one or two things that made no sense does not mean that you are entitled to, by entitled I mean in terms of God's law, to show dishonor to everything else they said. No, you're, you're not. And so we're back to, we're being thrown back on the word of God. And the, isn't there a commandment about honoring your father? Honoring your father. It's pretty your explicit. We're going to yeah. get there. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we've, we've got this, this wonderful complicated bounce that would not be difficult at all if we weren't sinners. <laughs> That's the Oh, rat. Part. There's the rub. <laughs> There's the rub. And so we want to be faithful to all of scripture. But for the purposes of this, this broadcast, this podcast, we don't want to be pointing fingers at lots of people over a lot of things with the sad possibility that we might lose friends and or listeners. But rather, we would have you all think, what things that I do in the Lord's Day, where can I find, first of all, where can I find explicit commands? You'd be surprised at how many things do not have explicit commands anywhere. Okay, so does that mean I junk them or do I fall da back down to principle, precedent, example, and such? Okay, can I at least justify what I'm doing on that basis? Is that good enough? And at this point, you're getting serious about thinking about worship and about how God reveals himself. And we're not, it's not our intention at this point to start calling this or that into question. Uh, let me mm -hmm. do some just vague things. Without picking a side, here, I can do this without picking a side, I think. <laughs> How many times do we observe the Lord's Supper in a calendar year? What kind of bread is it? What's in the cup? Mm -hmm. What kind of praises do we sing to God 
by whom were they written and with what accompaniment, if any, are they allowed to be performed? Okay, now I'm, I, I know I'm getting I'm getting near some sensitive stuff now, but I hope we've put enough disclaimers up front to say we're not here to tell you. We're here to ask you to think. Mm -hmm. And if you can think and you can come up with sound reasons, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Because most people don't. Most people fall into, guess what? Traditionalism. Tradition. And just because uh, other people have traditions doesn't mean that we don't too. And that you don't too. And you can write other people off. That's just a Lutheran tradition. That's a charismatic tradition. It's a Baptist tradition. Yeah, like the rest of us don't have traditions. And how dense can we sometimes be when we say, no, but we're Reformed, we're Presbyterian, or we stand on the word of God. <laughs> maybe, maybe we're just listening to our favorite pastors and their seminary professors back a few generations. Or maybe we're right. Maybe we're right for the wrong reason. Maybe we have good reasons, but we're not working them out well. It should worship matter? It's, it's, isn't this just all too fussy? Well, when it's the most important thing we do in this world, mm -hmm. probably no. Um, can we do it lovingly without uh, ripping each other to shreds? I think so. Paul kind of suggests things like not biting and devouring one another. Mm. But there's the possibility of thinking through these things from a biblical point of view, giving due attention to the voice of our ancestors, while still keeping in view the clear commandment, there are some things that are absolutes. Don't make pictures of God for religious purposes or any purposes, because you're, you're, you're lying at that point. You're distorting who God is. And don't fall down and worship them. Uh, I do not fall down to them, which is to say, worship them. Well, I'm just kind of kneeling before them and lighting a candle. I'm not really worshiping. No, the, the, the second commandment's very clear on some things. The other things, we need to start appealing to the rest of Scripture and seeing what the Bible says, interpreting Scripture by Scripture the way we do with everything else and not assuming that uh, we can chop off this or that because our tradition's not comfortable with this or that. Mm. So... Anyway, Brian, does that do justice in your minds to a discussion of the regulatory principle of worship for now? For something now. For, <laughs> say, I'm sure we'll there come back to There are books to be written. Uh, there are books to be on, written, you know. And that have been written. And there's some that shouldn't have been. But um, <laughs> stepping, stepping back a little bit, I want to tie this in to a couple things. I want to, I want to tie, this to, tie this up to, to everything all at once. How's that? <laughs> Because you kind of did, Brian, when you started talking about, about the commandments and how they summarize everything. Um, we saw the first commandment summarizes the very simple Christian worldview. There is a God. There is only one God. He is Yahweh. He is Jehovah. He is the triune creator. He is distinct from his creation. We speak of his transcendence, eminence, aseity, and all the rest. And he cannot be contained in anything he has made. He cannot be boxed up. He cannot be, therefore, manipulated, and that now brings us to the second and third commandments, where neither images nor words can move him, shape him, shake him up, force his hand, twist his arm. By the way, notice all of the uh, the anthropological <laughs> metaphors there. Yeah. Um, but rather, we, we have no way of getting at this God. He has to come to us, which is really great for us that he's the self-revealing God, revealing himself, as you've already said and his only begotten Son, who is his very image, and the Father and Son breathing forth their spirit to one another and now into our world and to us, so that he does, he, he seeks us. The other worldview, the pagan worldview, that of continuity of being, says that we scratch and claw to get to God, to obtain divinity, to lay our hands on heaven and make it ours, using basically magic and any other technology or knowledge or whatever that we got. But Christianity, the gospel says that God came down to us, and he came down as one seeking us with words. He calls us by words. He doesn't hand us images. He doesn't hand us magic devices. He doesn't hand us totems or talisman that will manipulate his will or his power on our behalf. He comes as one person true, the ab absolute personality, the, the God of all being, and yet a person, and talks to us as people and says, I'm the Lord your God. Here's how it's going to be. And so, whereas pagan religion emphasizes getting at God through things and emphasizes varyingly man's volition, his emotions, or his intellect, depending on 
who you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, Christianity embraces all three in that the Father, Son, and Spirit come to us in the person of Christ, who's prophet, king, and priest, and speaks to us in words that address our mind. We, we have to understand them rationally. Emotions, we, we should kind of like and be excited about what he's been telling us, except when it's the bad stuff that we cry. And then that, that move us volitionally, volitionally as kings to do stuff. And so we, we have here the worldview that supports religions of images. And we have this worldview we call Christianity that tells us God's coming to look for us. And he's coming to look for us as he did with Adam, calling out to us speaking to us, talking to us in words that we can process. And so when we come to a worship service, and this is the other thing we, we talked about talking about. When we come to a worship service then, God's the initiator. God calls us to worship. Mm -hmm. uh, traditionally in Reformed Presbyterian circles, and, and in fact, any circle that goes back very far, the service begins with a call to worship, usually drawn from Scripture. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Let us rend our hearts and not our hands, and so on. And he calls us, and he invites us, and then we respond. And then he says something to us, and we respond. And he says something more, and we respond. And eventually, we settle down, and he has a nice long heart-to-heart -heart talk with us through the power of his spirit, where he does open heart surgery and, and cuts to the quick and gets at our innermost needs and changes us. And all along the way, we are responding with prayer and thanksgiving and confession and this whole thing is worship, but notice that a lot of it is him talking to us. And sadly, we've got to the place in American Christianity where worship has come to mean we sing a lot. Maybe to God, maybe to one another, maybe to the audience, our congregation. But that's not a biblical concept of what worship is. Worship is God coming after us and revealing himself primarily in words. And, the, and then we, with all that we are, body and soul, mind, um, emotions, will, respond in faith and obedience and thanksgiving, saying, thank you, Lord. We don't deserve this, but thank you. And so we speak of the presence of Christ, not merely in the sacraments, as awesome as that is, but also the presence of Christ in the preached word. It is through the foolishness of preaching that God chose to save those who believe. We receive the Spirit not by the works of law, but by the hearing of faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. When they hear that you are all speaking the Word of God, you're all prophesying, they will confess that God is in you of a truth. This is basic New Testament Christianity, but it's something that we've lost as we tend to concentrate in our generation more on the things that make for emotional excitement or that compel some kind of immediate volitional response. Or, frankly, in our own traditions, that make us think about theology a lot and, and delve into abstractions. Yeah, yeah. I think this danger in, in our theological traditions of making worship the time to go and learn about God. Mm -hmm. It's not about learning about God. It's about worshiping God, just as our whole life is about worshiping God. I had a dear friend say once, and he probably didn't come up with this, but I remember it so clearly that he said, the whole point of life is to worship the true God rightly. Mm -hmm. And when we realize that, we realize the importance that each of these pieces has. You know, if this is what life is all about, let's do it the way he wants it, you know? Yeah, the way he wants it. And so we're back mm -hmm. to the regular principle, rightly understood. And he has, we have this whole Bible where every piece is connected to every other piece, and it's not as simple as simply pointing to one text, tearing it out of context, and talking about it. But we should notice all of the texts, and we should do the hard work of seeing how they fit together, and what is precedent, and what is principle, and what is what belongs to the older covenants, and it, it is not necessarily enforced anymore for our circumstances, or things that these are things that are allowed. You don't have to do them every Sunday, but. We want to honor God, as, you said, as your friend said, most important thing, worshiping the true God the way he wants. And clearly what he wants can be discerned in one way, from Scripture. And although going to church is not simply to learn about God, if we don't know the God that Scripture talks about, we're going to have trouble worshiping him properly. Yeah. So we, we can distinguish formal worship on the Lord's Day. From all the other instruction types, you know, you read through the book of Acts, and Paul was constantly teaching people. He wasn't just in churches on the Lord's Day. 
he was constantly talking to everybody from house to house and under all circumstances about who God is, who Jesus is. And so people who are content with a diet of, well, I heard a 40-minute sermon on Sunday. I'm good for the week. I am concerned for you if you are such, because this is the most important thing in life. Do you give so little attention to your family or your job or your savings account or your property, your backyard, your kitchen? Well, some people do. But (laughs) in, in, in general, things that are important, we spend a lot of time on. And usually the amount of time we spend is a measure of some sort of how much we value that thing. Yeah. So hopefully Mm -hmm. some convicting things for all of us here. Mm -hmm. Here's the thought. I was in a Facebook group where people talk about books, reformed books. It's a great group. Um, People get feedback and recommendations and that sort of thing. And someone had a really great question in in there the other day that was you know, what's a book that I can read that will help me to understand scripture better when I read it? And I was like, wow, the, you know, that should be all of us. Mm-hmm. But like, mm. we want to hear what our Lord has to say to us. And to me, that reminds me of the importance of doing the explaining in preaching, that your whole job as the preacher is to help people understand the word of God. You know, whether it's topical or you're going through a book or whatever you're doing, it's about the word of God in what you're saying. So as as we we come to a conclusion, um, I would like to remind us of a a, a couple of of New Testament passages. One is in Colossians uh, chapter 2, verse um, 23. I don't have my glasses on, so I can't see well. But Paul warns against legalisms of taste not, touch not, handle not. He says they have a show of wisdom in, and here's the phrase, will worship. Mm -hmm. That is worship that we have devised on our own, out of our own will. They look religious. They look spiritual. They look like they ought to be helpful in the Christian life. But Paul goes on to say that such things far from from having spiritual efficacy, have no power against the flesh. They have no power to restrain man's would-be autonomy. In fact, they feed it. When we depart from what God has told us to do in the name of, but this will help me more than what God had in mind, because obviously I know my needs better than God apparently does, that somehow this is going to make us better Christians. When Paul is saying here, no, that's exactly what will not happen. Uh, the other passage, and it's it's very similar, Jude speaks of walking in the way of Cain. What was the way of mm. Cain? Well, he worshipped the right God in the right place amidst, amongst the right community, but he brought his own sacrifice. He, again, will worship. He rejected the blood sacrifice and blood first fruits and grain offerings, which in the Old Testament system had a place. It just wasn't there. You had to bring the blood offering first. And when Abel confronted him, and Abel is, Christ does call him a prophet, and the only time we have any record of him saying anything, although we're not told the words, is when he was talking to Cain in the field. So presumably Jesus is saying, yeah, he was prophesying. He was speaking the word of God. He was speaking the gospel to Cain and saying in some words or other, yeah, you may think that bringing your best stuff that that's really helping your relationship with God. Have you noticed how he said eh, no to that? <laughs> you 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 thought in your spiritual pride and self righteousness that this would be a help to your relationship to God, and it's proved exactly the opposite. Don't you see that? But the possibility of coming back to the blood of the Lamb is always open to you, and I'd be glad to help you with that. That's which is probably about the point where Cain picked up a rock or something and killed him. Because the the way of Cain is the way of self-righteousness. And as, as Abram and Sarai uh, sinned in substituting Hagar for Sarah and got Ishmael instead of Isaac in the name of helping God, so all of so in all of our religious endeavors, when we go beyond what God has said, we don't get the good stuff. We don't get the Holy Spirit. We don't get God's blessing. We get the wrath of God, and we 
build up our own self-righteousness. And we get angry with God's people who are simply trying to call us back to Jesus. And we call them all kinds of horrible names, and we may even persecute them, and we may even kill them. Because they've gotten in the way of our basic religious impulses, and we mean so well. Don't they get it? And this this is something we're going to see a lot, I suspect, as we continue on in our series. It's, it's easy to to see, well, we've got Christianity here and horrible paganism or horrible humanism over there. Uh, since I think I've said before, the worst enemies of the church always come up within the church. Mm -hmm. Abel was not killed by the serpent. He was killed by his brother who had just come from worshiping God. Jesus was betrayed by his best friend. And in the Psalms, he says, we went to the Lord's house together and had sweet fellowship. The Galatian heretics came, came to be teachers of the word who were even better than Paul. And this is where grace always meets its challenge. It always meets it in the person of those who think they want God, but they think they can do God one better. God says no images, but wait, you don't understand how much this image helps me. Yeah. No. I'm reminded of a character in a book. I won't say what book for fear of spoilers <laughs> if anyone is reading it. But it is a great book and a classic book. <laughs> this character is a clergyman and speaks very passionately about the gospel and about God's grace. And yet one of the first insights we get about this character is he, the the narrator, the um, first person point of view narrator, um, says, you know, I found peace in Christ and I could tell this guy didn't have it. Mm. And he goes on to be a missionary and, you know, spread the gospel to hundreds of people in India. And, you know, thinking about, you know, if this were a real person, those people in India could truly receive the gospel from this man whose heart it has not touched. Yeah. And that's the grace of God in his word. That's not anything that the clergyman can brag about. The reformers insisted that the efficacy of the word and sacraments do not depend upon the person administering or the person preaching, but solely upon the words and upon the power of the Spirit of God. Having said that, we don't want to raise up a lot of hypocrites and send them out and fund them well, because God can strike a straight blow right. with a crooked stick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how God we get things. spiritual abuse. That's a bad yeah. thing. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, you were going to say something? Yes, uh, not just the reformers, but also the early church and its rejection yeah. of Donatism. Mm -hmm. mm. yep. Yes, that is the same Good debate. Point. It's a problem we've been dealing with for the whole time, <laughs> yeah. pretty much, and, and no long, doubt will continue time. to because nothing's new under the sun. Yep. Speaking of nothing new under the sun, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know what that has to do with recommendations, but it's time for recommendations. <laughs> uh, Greg, you mentioned you had one. All right. So my uh, recommendation, uh, spurred wholly by some things Emily said, is R.C. Sproul's book, Knowing Scripture. My wife recommended it to me a long time ago, and I have made use of it, uh, particularly when I was writing my lecture notes for hermeneutics in my Introduction to Scriptures class. It's written for the ordinary Christian. He doesn't dumb it down, but he's clear and to the point. And if you have been led astray or simply are new to the faith and want to know how to interpret the Bible, how the Bible, in fact, interprets itself, this is a wonderful book to begin with. And you can find it on Amazon or probably other places. Cool, cool. Brian, do you have one? I do, yes. Uh, at risk of making people think that I am a dirty papist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to uh, recommend a book that is in keeping with uh, with caveats, that is in keeping with Greg's description of not completely ignoring people because they said two or three wrong things. <laughs> and that is a book that I just finished yesterday evening called Medieval Wisdom in – I just forgot the next part of the subtitle, but – <laughs> There'll be a link for it. It's medieval <laughs> wisdom for the modern Christian, essentially. Basically, it's about C.S. Lewis and medieval uh, theology and philosophy. And what I found so wonderful about it, this is where the caveats come in, besides where he touches on transubstantiation and images of Christ, Oops. which is what exactly <laughs> what we're talking about this episode, <laughs> he dispels a lot of the lazy and inaccurate what's the word i'm looking for assumptions caricatures caricatures yes 
the lazy and inaccurate caricatures of the medieval period as you know full of backwards people who hung around in mud and <laughs> talked about sky dad or something you know these lazy new atheism uh types of things <laughs> and basically talks about the medievals had this beautiful sacramental view of the world and whether or not that's the right way to look at the world <laughs> it did inform very well ministries of mercy mm-hmm. and pursuit of theological knowledge that was not just again a caricature you know how many angels can dance on the head of a pin it was it was practical and helpful towards spiritual growth in not only the the ministers but also to the laymen and uh you know there were a couple times where i just thought i wonder where he's going with this up oh, oh he went where i didn't want him to okay and you just kind of <laughs> have to compartmentalize that but it's a very wonderful book that you know, it was very helpful in realizing, you know, the Reformation was a good thing. And I'm really glad that it happened. But it's not like the entire medieval period was lost. You know, I'm going to interrupt uh, Emily's recommendation to tag something on there. Ooh. I have worked with two church history books. One's Dutch Reformed, the Presbyterian. There are many, many good things you could say about them. What you cannot say is that they have any concept of what the Middle Ages were. Yeah. Uh, It's like from the day the church councils ended, if you can get that far, um, darkness fell. Nobody knew the gospel. Everybody worshiped Mary. Um, The Pope was the Antichrist. Uh, And the only things that happened were things that were in, you could either critique medieval society or you can um, use the excesses and the errors and the sins of the medieval period to slam Rome some more. Mm. I, I, I would fear if these same historians, and, and they're representative of, of a lot of church historians and, and seminary instructors, I, I would hate for them to be pushed into the future and write the history of our age. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've just grabbed stuff off the internet, off Christian radio and Christian TV, off the Christian bestseller list, uh, visit a few churches in a few big cities and sum it all up and say, this was Christianity at the beginning of the 21st century. I would be horrified, I would think, oh, because yes. it's, not, it's not accurate. And, and the assumption from historians, both Presbyterian and Baptist, and they both have access to right here, is that when once we were done fighting over um, the deity of Christ, the Trinity, and, 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 and such, the hypostatic union, that we just lost everything and that the people there were ignorant. They did not know the gospel. They did not know Christ with a few shiny exceptions. May people may be willing to admit or with some underground groups, depending which side of this you're on. Everyone likes Augustine. <laughs> well, there are people who don't <laughs> because you know what? He's Roman Catholic. Well, there's that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so th- this is a point where the ninth commandment comes into play. I think don't bear false witness of things you have no idea about. Mm-hmm. And and the truth is there's a lot that we're not, we're never going to know for certain because we don't have sermons on a weekly or even yearly basis from every pastor who preached for that thousand year period. Nor have we, do we have a way of talking to the layman who profited or not from those sermons. But we do have some, some hints that by the late medieval period, when people were writing things like Canterbury Tales, Ordinary people got it. They got the scriptural mm-hmm. allusions. They may not have agreed with all the doctrines, or maybe they did, but they, they knew about them. They were not totally ignorant. And, and by and large, they were not as ignorant as the average American Christian in the 21st century. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's my little tirade for the moment. Emily, what's your... Uh... <laughs> I appreciate the add-on. <laughs> yeah, thank you. My recommendation is a recommendation of art. Art is a good thing. So... I have a friend who went to my college. Um, I kind of know him. I know his sister a little bit better. Um, But he recently found rest afresh in Christ, um, the doctrines of grace, and so has been doing a lot of work inspired by Reformed theology. And he doesn't have an online store set up, to my knowledge. I'll link to his, like, portfolio. But he posted some typography work that he'd done on Facebook. And I was like, oh my word, I love this. Can I get a print? 
Um, and I don't think he was really prepared for that kind of conversation, but uh, he cut me a deal. So I now have five wonderful canvas prints that David had put together for a gift for me for our anniversary. Um, and it's the five solas um, in typography and this great color palette. Nice. So I'm going to recommend checking out my friend Ethan's portfolio, and I'm going to recommend having beautiful things in your house. Oh, because in all of our talking about images, we need to remember not that like we're really in danger of forgetting because we all crave beauty, right? But like mm -hmm. have beautiful things in your house. It makes your life better. Go um. sign. <laughs> 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 On that note, thank you so much for listening. And thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, this was a short notice recording on some level. Um, thank you also to David, our producer, my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to our financial supporters. If you'd like to join their number, you can check out our website, which is anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Uh, you can find us on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel if that's your thing. Uh, like our Facebook page if you're there. Yeah. See you next week. Keep on listening.